And a very important, important, uh, important component of this is, the, is presenting the results of the STARF surveys so that people can understand that whatever views they had and expressed was actually observed and then concrete things that the management team intends to do as response to the STARF survey. Very often STARF surveys are done, kind of filed and forgotten. Bit of lip service at the board meeting, perhaps. But it's really important that by, by sort of throwing it back to the, to the staff, you also show that you, you take those surveys very, very seriously. So this staff survey uh, was, was done and it was specifically crafted to capture uh, rooms for improvement. It was not as a sort of uh, look how good we are type of kind of exercise. It was really trying to sort of to, to suck out what was real needs for improvement. The unfortunate thing was that the thing that we had to do that was sort of top of the list was please can we move away from Acton? A um, little harder to accommodate. <laughs> Um, there are many other things you can do um, than that. And we can't change Acton. For those of you, there's some other people here, I think, who work in that neighborhood. I'm sure you've, that popped up in your surveys, too. <laughs> and if it hasn't, we would love some tips on how we can <laughs> glorify Acton. So how else do we communicate? Um, we uh, have... The, the big chat and this was trying to get a sense of uh, b slightly more informal uh, but to get the, a sense of what what, it, what love film meant to them uh, we think that brands are not just about what happens externally brands is also what happens internally so you could argue this was kind of a reflection in the, uh, of that as well you can't have a, an external facing brand and think that's going to carry if it's not reflected in what you, ha what you do inside the company. And there needs to be a correlation between those two perceptions. And then we have these uh, brown bag sessions, which, uh, which is a, in essence is a sort of a, um, this is kind of a uh, lunch. Um, open <coughs> communication. It's not very different from, I'm sure, what some, some of the other things you do. As an interesting thing is this is, on an individual basis, we have these quarterly uh, performance-related um, pay reviews, which is like a mini-review. Uh, it's also tied to compensation. And that's proven quite successful in recalibrating individual goals. Not company goals or division goals, but individual goals uh, set on a quarterly basis. Sounds like a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's meant to be done. I mean, it is a lot of work, but, <laughs> but it's, it's meant to be brief. So it's not, it's not, it's not trying to kind of be, be a, be a full on thing, but it also, it all, the feedback has been is that a yearly thing is too long, basically. So for, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this and do this yourself, whoops. Uh, any particular questions on some of these other initiatives? <coughs> yeah. Actually, I just wondered how you involved employees, but particularly with the warehouse staff, um, in uh, making. Uh, Can you repeat your question? Sorry, yes. Um, are there any initiatives for particularly the warehouse staff to uh, improve their own working practices? Yeah. Um, so. So the warehouse staff, particularly brown bag sessions, are really good because they raise any health and safety issues and any new initiatives, and it's a good communication tool. But also, they've just introduced the PRP performance related pay, so it's not just a matter of the speed of getting the DVDs into the envelope; it's actually the accuracy as well. Now that's just been introduced, um, so we're still to see, you know, the results of that. But that will be a quite a, um, a quite a good tool. I and I mean, it's one of the challenges for us this year, actually, to make sure we integrate the DC with the office and make sure they're in line with Love Film and they're proud of Love Film as well. 
Commons, I think that's because they're based in Peterborough. There's always an office and a warehouse, a bit of a divide, so that's something we really need to work on. And it definitely an area for improvement. Okay, thank you. Right, so as you might have picked up, uh, the, the the sort of head office uh, staff uh, programs is, a, is is easier to tailor make because actually it's quite hard to capture. There's, there's so many different requirements and needs by the warehouse staff. It's a little hard to accommodate a lot of that, um, and there's a lot of turnover. So it's a little. It's it's a, it's a tough cha uh, challenge, um, but. <coughs> Still, we have people who've been there for five years um, who are incredibly good at what they do. So there, there's, there are exceptions to this. But for people who come and go, uh, it's a little harder to kind of keep that momentum. Um, in one of my other companies, we recently laid off 50% of its staff. And the mood is quite different. Not bad, just different. And I'll come to why that is. <laughs> For the companies that goes through these significant layoffs, uh, the rule number one is to try to do it once. Try to avoid sort of iterative cuts. It is uh, incredibly painful um, for morale and kind of treat the initial announcement, announcement as sort of a D-Day. Be prepared for everything you need to do, do it once, and focus your efforts on the ones you're keeping. All the other guys who are not keeping scream louder, need more attention, but actually you have to be a bit cynical and focus on the people you want to keep because they are as worried as anyone else about what's going to happen next. So, so far I've focused on things that, uh, as I would think that most of you would know as HR professionals. Uh, it's sort of a bit kind of heightened, perhaps, uh, in these days. And whatever you do, just do a lot more of it, uh, and deeper, and from the boss. Don't allow yourself to be wedged between yourself and management. Insist that management bring the bad news themselves. So the final section today, I'm going to focus a little bit on what I would say is out of the normal business practice, um, because uh, I think it's important to at least have them as a sort of backdrop. This may not work for your company, but it's at least uh, the spirit of it, uh, it's worth a try. So an alternative to cutting the workforce by 10% is to cut salaries by 10%. When Steve Jobs took over Apple after a decade of, uh, uh, of doing other things, uh, he took a, a $1 salary. Now you could argue that he could afford that and so on, but the signaling effect was immense when it, comes to, when it came to the expectation of other employees, etc. You may all have heard of the f uh, sort of famous Sequoia Ventures meeting in early November. Has everyone heard about this? OK. Sequoia Venture uh, is the leading venture capital company in the world. They backed Yahoo, and they backed Google, and they backed a whole bunch of others that you've heard of, just to give you a flavor. Uh, they called all of their companies together at a crisis meeting and said, this is going to be the worst thing you've ever been through, and you need to do something now. And, and in essence, uh, they, they, they got their companies to cut costs like they've, you've never seen before. And in 10 of our companies, the executives started, but they, and they cut most of themselves, and then they cut down to the organization. And that's the only way it's going to work. If the executives sort of s try to sort of skirt the issue, there's no help. There's, you're going to get no sympathy down the ranks. But if it's done, hard and across the board and the biggest cuts from the top, it's incredible what you can get people to do in order to kind of save the collective but also to save their own jobs. But you probably need to give them an incentive on the way back up. If things go really well, you can get your cut back and more. 